So, thanks everyone. Great to um, follow those two presentations because we're very much talking about both data and about open practices. Um, and um, so, uh, lovely to be in this session. Um, and really, we feel that recent events have brought into sharper relief um, how <coughs> our data is being collected and processed and potentially is used against us. Um, but we also wanted to highlight that it's not all doom and gloom. There are um, changes happening in the data world, such as um, GDPR, and also such as the Open Government Partnership, um, which are offering us new ways of uh, protecting our data and also of interacting and engaging with, um, with the data that's out there. And um, for our presentations, as we learned that we were going to be live streamed, um, we felt that it was, uh, and, and therefore competing with Netflix, we thought we need a bit of a, a, a th an entertaining theme, so I uh, hope you'll um, indulge us in this. Okay, uh, one, of, one of our aims is to talk about uh, how we shape participation and what we mean by participation. So we're looking at the point of our, our study, Open Government Partnership. The Open Government Partnership is a coalition of plus over 70 countries that advocate for and foster transparency, accountability and participation. What do those three mean things? God, what, what do they mean by participation? How we foster participation? And ODP has three core components, national commitments, open data, and public documentation. And it's layered at five levels. So one is to inform the citizenship, to inform the people about the things they're doing, to consult the people so that little participation instances where people is asked what the governments could do to improve their services, to involve the people into the processes to collaborate with the civil society, with the students, with the teachers, with the universities into developing national plans, action plans and commitments, but also to empower communities. So we're looking at those five layers. Um, most of the themes um, coming around um, ODP, of the national commitment levels is governance, open data, education, transparency, capacity building. But what do they mean by that? So. So we think it's really important to recognize that we're now living in a datafied society, drawing on uh, Schaefer and Van Es, uh, where almost everything is transformed into data. It's being quantified and analyzed um, from birth to death, studying, voting, buying, establishing relationships, getting a job or traveling. Um, everything that we're doing is leaving digital footprints, digital traces, um, and this data is also potentially used as a political tool. And Hood and Margetz have uh, proposed that government agencies act as both detectors, which gather information and data from individuals in society, and also as effectors, which seek to influence people. And, um, and we think, as we've um, illustrated with our uh, daily profit, um, <laughs> that also we need to think about the, how the media operates in these, in these ways as well, in, uh, in both discovering and creating information, and also in influencing the way that we understand it and the way that we think about it. So in order to understand how governments and the media can both affect and manipulate our habits, our conduct, our political views, and the way we establish relationships within society, um, we need to develop skills um, that will help us understand how this information is being depicted, um, helping us make informed decisions um, towards uh, acting um, as citizens and as individuals. When, when we think about those, those issues, participation and democracy and education and being manipulated by the media, by the government, and actually by all, all the agencies, including corporations, we need to look at what us as educational society have to do with a data-fight society. If our countries, and most of countries, are part of the OGP, are members of the OGP, uh, they need to foster um, training and educational programs towards committing into citizenship education. And citizenship, uh, citizenship education around these areas have three key components. Statistical literacies, political literacies, and media literacies. They need to work together. We need to be aware of the situations because if, as we can see, data every day is portrayed in the media. X percent, three percent, half of the people, half of the, half of the population, half of the Londoners want to do X. People don't like immigrants, for example. We see this data every day. 
how people know or can relay on the data that is portrayed on the newspapers. And we need to start developing a politically literate citizenry. And how do we do that? Uh, because democracy requires a commitment to participate and take action and also to monitor the government activities. We, we need to be more active, not only as individuals, but also as communities. And every community we participate needs to make action towards challenging and evaluating, assessing the government's activities. So in order to bridge education and, and participation um, and really uh, take advantage of the opening of government information, we need to form a bridge between civil society, industry, research and politics, promoting development of a critical and informed citizenship, fostering effective and efficient use of information, allowing citizens to critically participate in democratic and social dynamics. And so in this sense, we propose what we're calling an open pedagogy of citizenship, um, the idea of which is to empower learners and open educators and advocates to become cognizant of the rhetorical and influential techniques used by governments, the media and corporations, so they can become information gatherers, um, detectors, as we mentioned earlier, and influential agents or effectors in society. So it's not only about now the government and the media being effectors and detectors, but also our, our students as citizens. And in order to do this, we believe it's vital to embed political, media, and statistical literacies to develop transversal skills for both lifelong and life-wide learning. Um, so in other words, not only for um, training for uh, the workforce, but, um, for, but for your engagement as a citizenship um, in, in society. Uh, to enable people to understand and critically analyze information and data from media and government sources. Empower people to become critically engaged data intermediaries who are empowered to act as social detectors and effectors in the service of social justice and democratic values. Um, we need to think about foster participation. And actually, the use of open data, as open educational resources, can foster citizenship in education to establish connections between the uh, learning, teaching and learning activities, and social political problems. How many of our students know what's going on around our own universities? How many people is homeless around Bristol University? Is there any relationship? Is people in the university working with the society to improve people's lives? Are we doing that? Um, we need to learn to take and evaluate information presented in the media. We need to be politically responsible of our decisions. Everything we do, as we're going to be datafied, will be used at some point for or against us, quite likely against us. Um, but we need to understand that if we bring to the lecture, to the, to the theater, to, to, we learn to bring to the classroom data and open data and actually uh, wiki data to, to teach students to, to work with the same um, raw materials that not only polit politicians or um, uh, the industry work, but also the civil society, the scientists and the press used in the effort to develop uh, policies and also research. We need to have data literated people. We cannot keep having an entire generation of people that cannot understand the difference between a media and an average. We, we aim with, with all these conceptualizations to foster social justice. Open data as <coughs> object, as a standalone element, does not promote social justice. We need to make very clear on that. Actually, now we have two groups of people, those that can understand and relate with data and are data literate, and those who are excluded completely from the political participation or the media interactions because they don't understand anything about data, they don't have statistical literacies, and actually they become a mere object of study. This is something that we need to, to, to think about. Who are the privileged ones? The ones that can, oh, easily, understand data, we say, oh, this is actually not clear, not valid, oh, I don't believe what my government is saying. Because they relate, they understand data, but what happens with the people that are a mere object of study? They don't have the capacities, they don't have, the so open data by itself can be actually a very dangerous thing if it's not used pro-social justice. And we thought a key example to think about this is the example of uh, data about education. Um, because 
it's not only using data in education, but also thinking about how the data about education reflects actually a non-neutral set of, of priorities and, uh, and kind of knowledge claims that are being made when, when, when this, ki this kind of data is released. So, so when you have this, the school data that's trying to tell you about school quality um, and is saying, oh, this school is, uh, is inadequate, then, um, then actually what, in, in a sense, what we're being presented with is open data as an alternative to social justice. So rather than uh, actually having adequately funded schools, which can all be excellent, um, we merely are provided the data in order to have, to make choices about which schools to attend or to send our children to attend. And actually, if we look at this map, we'll see that when these children graduate from the schools and they are adults, this data will be looked for future employers. It's like, oh, you are from an inadequate school. Therefore, you are inadequate. Who is to blame? Is the school or the teachers or the students for portraying a school as inadequate? We are talking about people. We are talking about children. I don't think it's fair to portray children, their schools, their environments, actually their social environment as inadequate because that's actually mean poor, mean deprived, uh, are they cutting meals at school? Are they cutting teachers? What are they doing? So I think this, every time that we see data portrayed in that manner, what reflects humans, we need to think twice. Who is inadequate here? Is the government or the council at that, that year of London that is not putting enough money or the children? So um, one of the ways to monitor the government activities, for example, um, budgeting and schools, is to work at civic mon with civic monitoring approaches. Um, this is quite uh, well practiced in Italy, and actually Butiglione and Reggio are, are kind of presenting um, a protocol called uh, um, civic monitoring uh, on Monith on Italy that allows people, students, teachers, uh, groups of people, us as a community of educators, to look into access to information, anti-corruption, capacity building, education, civic education, public participation, open, open governmental data, and transparency and accountability. We can look into where are the deficits, where are the issues in our government, in our regions, in our councils, and work that and bring those social problems to the classroom. Because if we want to work with social, um, with research-based learning or we all, um, problem-based learning activities, we have loads of real issues in the society that we can foster and we can help resolve from inside the classroom because we need to think that most of our students are privileged enough to be in the university. So if we can start working not only for the, um, the um, capacities that the industry needs, that the market needs, but also that the society needs, we actually may help a little bit into change the society and not have two groups of people that will be like those capable to analyze data and those being studied and turned into data. So if you want to look into how to, how to co-create and how to solve real problems, how to work with the society, look at the co-creation standards from the Open Government Partnership that can be translated into group work activities within a classroom because it fosters empowerment, co-creation, participation, and public deliberation. Be work with your students into solving little problems, so problems from inside the university, and start making them and widening these problems. Also, uh, what is going on around the areas around the university, what's going on in your council, what's going on in your city, your country, your region, and basically how to start fixing poverty and deprivation and exclusion. I think that's what we're going to leave behind. It's mostly, I'm going to give you more questions and answers, and we're happy to, to talk to you later. Um, so here's the list of spells if you want to <laughs> read <laughs> some good research, research later, and this is how you can contact us. Thank you. I think I'm going to start blending with the background. It's the invisibility cloak, you can see. Is it data or money? Haven't we turned everything into money? Have, um, I think we can start recommending a, a good reading, um, Weapons of Math Destruction. That, yeah. yeah, read it, because it's monetization, uh, algorithms, and you don't need to forget that data is produced by humans and the algorithm that analyzes them too. So it's actually money and corruption behind it many, many times. 
So I would say follow the money rather than the data. The data may be a red herring, or it may only be a sign yes. that there's something else going yeah, on. Yeah, follow the money, absolutely. And follow the corruption. Sam? Yeah, following on with that, there's another really interesting book from the States from Virginia Eubank about automating inequality and about algorithmic <laughs> systems that did some vaguely terrifying things um, around using data. This is the digital redlining, that kind of... Oh, it's, it's <laughs> horrific. If you haven't read it, please read it. Um, with kind of open government and government data, it, it kind of becomes quite scary. And some of the things that we've done in the UK are nothing compared to some of the crazy crap that went down in the US. So this builds on um, something that Lorna was talking about this morning and um, what's just been said about uh, money as well. So there's been alternatives to GDP, like the Human Development Index and that kind of stuff. But if essentially, if you work within the capitalist system, then everything's reducible to money. And it seems like people who don't want to work in that system haven't got a way of measuring things because things aren't reducible to a common currency. Now, I was just wondering if you were aware of any work that might have been done in that area that we could reference. That's a great question, That's but I don't think that we are. <laughs> uh, send really us a tweet. Question. We'll follow your question. And um, that's maybe something that we can ask for other stakeholders, both at the open data community and the OGP community that can help us to, to find it. Because we also keep learning about new things every day. Um, I think Sheila was raising a hand. Oh, yeah. Um, sorry. Um, it, it, I suppose, it, again, it, it just raises... Uh, not so much by, by, I suppose, data, money, but I think there's, there's the ethical aspect that in education we have a really critical role in, in highlighting that yeah. um, and reminding government of their ethical responsibilities and empowering citizens to ask those questions about what are the ethics of the data collection that you are doing. And I think if we had more of that kind of level of discourse at an everyday level, then people would question school league tables more. Um, so, I think uh, yeah. absolutely, um, uh, you know, echoing uh, what Lorna was saying really this morning about if if we're not going to do it, then then who is? And um, and I think that the the you know in a sense, I mean, we 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 do want to celebrate the open government partnership as um, as a, a, an excellent set of commitments to open up information, but we also have to be highly critical of that information, and um, and 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 really train people to uh, to investigate what does it really mean, what's what's not being collected as well. And also, we need to start looking into us communities of open educators to start foster commitments in open education, because apart from Chile, uh, Romania, now Slovak Slovakia and Greece and the United States, not many countries have a commitment. And those commitments can lead to policy that can help enhancing these literacies or improving on actually developing the literacies that people need in the country for, part uh, for, for um, democratic participation. Because if not, it's going to just be, become another game of exclusion. I, I think you can see by your questions that you were wonderfully provocative in getting people to make connections between what you're saying and the questions you're asking and many other areas. And that's, I think, a, a sign of success for what you just did. Um, one other thing that uh, was called to mind when I listened to you was this body of work more recently around critical data literacies. Yes. And are you connecting with that? Because it seems like very productive collisions between what they're doing and what you're talking about. I mean, de definitely, um, definitely we are. We, we're sort of uh, developing a more, um, a much more kind of detailed version of this. Um, so, uh, it, so that it, it's, uh, we, we couldn't talk about, about everything, but, um, but that, that, that does relate to some of the um, previous work that we've done on, on working with, um, with open data. Um, and um, and I think that um, it's absolutely it's absolutely vital that you know um, in in all of these open spaces the you know the, the criticality has always got to be there. Yeah. So a little bit of like for you is to question when the, the people say, "Oh, we want to enhance participation. We wanted to promote participation. We want people to participate." You need to ask them, "How do you want them? How are you going to do it for people to participate? What spaces are you opening up for people to participate, and how are you training them?" And how are we training our students? Because if you download the database for participation on OGP commitments, it's huge. 
but there are very scarce elements of training and education in within uh, fostering participation. So we need to be aware there's actually now a little bit of a bubble of promoting participation, but not including everyone. Um, so this is something that we all as a community of educators need to start thinking about. And yeah. Can we disappear? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you.